This thesis is a reflection, a kind of meta-reflection on my own personal experience going through environmental education, and discovering there, and then contending with, the discourses surrounding René Descartes. As such, this thesis is titled Meditations on Meditations on Meditations. At the start of my journey through environmental education, I found, just as elsewhere, scholars attempt to make sense of how we arrived at the present. They judge how things have unfolded and where they look to be going. Works by many of our favorite authors may recognize and highlight pollution and resource extraction, species extinctions, and climate change. And they may discuss the loss of a sense of connection, connections to one another, to other species, or to the whole rest of existence. And they may notice that many of us have turned away from the sacred and numinous. Assessing the situation, they may point to the failings of our education system or to the excesses of capitalism, science, or modernity. And they may do all of the above. Noticing various ideological or philosophical threads and trends, scholars will trace these to their root. And, within our course readings, I found an overwhelming volume of voices arriving at a common source to many of our problems. To my surprise, one man, the late medieval European mathematician and philosopher René Descartes. I'd heard of Descartes before, sure, the, uh, I think, therefore I am guy. But I knew nothing more than that, and, to be honest, I wasn't entirely unsure what that was supposed to mean. But here he seemed to be framed, though perhaps only to my interpretation, as a major source of the world's evil, a key figure steering Western civilization, or the whole species, down a wide range of wrong paths. Surprised by how unanimous and tidy this picture was, I went looking for more information. And that's when things started getting weird. It was true that almost any discussion of major themes within or adjacent to environmental education brings up ideas which may be traced to this one 17th century thinker. Ideas such as rationalism and positivism, mechanism and materialism, atomism and dualism, anthropocentrism, and on. So it made some sense how folks arrived at this name. Still, everywhere I looked for more details, I found a story quite different from the above consensus. What I learned wasn't a slightly different version of events, say, or a different take on the meaning of those events, no. What I found and interpreted for myself was an entire ecosystem of personal accounts and ideas, historical events and literary examples, as well as linguistic evidence that felt to me to converge on a wildly divergent and even contradictory picture. In our course readings, I learned about a cold, rationalist mathematician, one who sought or helped to break the spell of the magical and mystical. In fact, by some accounts, his ideas are said to have eventually sapped all sacredness and shattered the entire universe. But in browsing what came up under his name on Wikipedia, and then in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I discovered, to my surprise, a Roman Catholic, a seemingly devout Roman Catholic, one whose life's work was inspired by a set of divine visions, dreams, three of them, in which an angel delivered him a sacred vision, a vision of the unification of all knowledge and things in God's universe, an insight and philosophy he visualized as a tree. A tree whose roots, he declared, were the sacred. That contradiction felt odd. Not only was it effectively a reversal of the story I had, but I hadn't even gone digging for any of this. No, this was the first thing I found. And, given the source, what seemed like the scholarly consensus. So, I just had to be confused or missing something critical. So, deeper I went. I wondered about some of Descartes' big ideas and those key concepts associated with him. We'd read about his mechanistic thinking, his clockwork metaphor, one likening the material world to a clock or a machine. All the same, I couldn't imagine how any medieval notion of a clock or any of the constellation of sentiments surrounding it could be anything like my own. When I think of a clock, I think of a ubiquitous and inert bit of battery-powered, throwaway, factory-made plastic on sale at Ikea for two ninety nine. But no part of that seemed like it could possibly be contained within Descartes' metaphor. So I wondered what associations exactly a medieval clock could contain. I went looking, and, to my surprise, I learned that clockwork and the automata that inspired it were not European innovations, but instead arrived from the East, Persia, and Asia. And I learned that the first European mechanical clocks were born of the church, engineered by monks for the purpose of prayer. And I learned that as the centuries wore on, clocks only became more sacred, as they became more elaborate, 
growing into tremendous, often deemed miraculous monuments to creation. I learned that these clocks combined earthly nature with heavenly astrology, then synonymous with astronomy, and blended these with biblical verse. These were almost priceless creations funded by popes and emperors, built over decades by teams of laborers, artisans, engineers, and astronomers. Taking inspiration from nature and scripture, they composed with math and geometry and worked in wood, stone, iron, and gold. They concocted fantastically elaborate, often multi-story symphonic simulacra of the known physical and metaphysical universe. These contained dazzling arrays, charting the movements and phases of the sun, moon, planets, and stars. They expressed the signs of the zodiac and recommended ideal times for seed sowing and bloodletting, and commanded daily celebrations of the saints. And all of this could be found accompanied by the hourly procession of the Twelve Apostles, with glimpses of the Mother Mary and Baby Jesus, and all ushered in by crows from the bellows of a gilded rooftop clockwork rooster. These were more than works of public or devotional art. These were enchanted marvels, living, storytelling sculptures of multimodal magic expressing community and faith and the cutting edge of technology and understanding. And I learned that these clocks brought prestige to whole cities, entire regions, and even nations. And I learned that, in medieval times, nobles and peasants alike made pilgrimage to these clocks. And even now they attract crowds who stand in delight and awe. I couldn't think of a modern equivalent of such a thing. I figured you'd have to somehow combine Gaudi's Sagrada Familia with the large hat on Collider and, what, stick it at the bottom of the sea? And even then I don't think you'd capture for modern audiences the feeling elicited five or eight centuries ago by an encounter with the miracle of clockwork in a church. So was this the clockwork to which Descartes likened a speck of dust or a rock, a mold or a mushroom? Well, he didn't have Ikea or plastics, factories or mass production, or ubiquitous sources of standardized, secularized time. Okay, so the metaphor didn't translate perfectly across the centuries, but how seminal was Descartes' metaphor, I wondered? Was he the first or most influential, or even just the loudest, to have used such a metaphor? Well, I went looking. What I found was that, starting three and a half centuries before Descartes' time, German mystics, Catholic bishops and saints, medieval feminists and the who's who of early European poets and late medieval astronomers were all comparing nearly everything to machines and clockwork. And they did so in no less than three languages, and within what were the most celebrated and widely read texts throughout Europe generation after generation after generation. Some of these authors you will know. St. Henri Sousseau, Jean Foisard, Bishop Nicole Orem, Geoffrey Chaucer, Christine de Pizan, William Shakespeare, John Dunn, Johannes Kepler. Well, that was upsetting. I couldn't imagine how anyone talking about clockwork metaphors could possibly arrive at Descartes as its source. Further, as a result of all this, the whole clockwork construction suddenly felt neither Western nor modern, and, even within Europe, not as the critique demands, born of rationalism or science so much as mysticism and poetry. That forced me to critically consider the other big idea Descartes is known for, his dualism, the idea that there's a fundamental distinction between two irreducible features of reality, the material and the immaterial, or matter and consciousness. At the outset, it seemed to me that dyads, dichotomies, and entire dualistic frameworks were ubiquitous throughout the natural world, spelled out in the bodies and actions of life's many forms, and even in the background rhythms of the cosmos. So, any such twofold notion, then, didn't feel so much radical as obvious. But then it occurred to me that there were whole cultures, religions, and worldviews throughout the globe and across time that were profoundly dualistic, even ones that sounded to me remarkably Cartesian. Just one of the many examples is Sankhya, the theoretical foundation to yoga. It's a deeply rationalist school of Hinduism premised upon a narrow set of acceptable proofs for attaining knowledge, one that also establishes a strict doctrinal division between two fundamental elements, consciousness and matter. Finding that blew me away. I considered Hinduism and yoga effectively the antithesis of Cartesian dualism, Certainly the Western scientific rationalism said to have been birthed by it. So here again I'd had my assumptions thrown out and this whole Descartes discourse further disrupted. It suggested, if only to me, 
that our thinking on these themes were not going far enough afield or deeply enough into our collective past to present a sufficiently encompassing and coherent picture. And this picture I was starting to formulate was so askew that I couldn't help but continue my inquiry. As I started reading more, I became convinced that modern authors and, and even translators weren't accounting for semantic shift, the evolution of meaning across time. So I had to get into the derivation and meaning of words. Doing so, I discovered there are plenty of shocking revelations. The simplest was that Descartes is commonly referred to as a scientist, one doing science. And yet, every etymological source I could find agreed that the modern meanings and connotations we have with these words are brand spanking new, arriving no less than centuries after Descartes' death. So, though perhaps only to me, calling Descartes a scientist felt something like referring to Galileo as, what, an astronaut? Or Plato a podcaster? As I went on, I learned that machina, the Latin root of the modern English word machine, started out meaning a material or immaterial structure, especially a fabric, as in the fabric of the universe, and that in late medieval times the machine included anything that could move without human intervention, so a sailboat or windmill, a water fountain or horse-drawn buggy, or yes, a clock, were all, by definition, machines. So had we gotten all of this backwards? As suggested earlier, clockwork was inspired by nature and faith, and here Descartes' metaphor seemed less likely to be read as the universe being clock-like, meaning it's composed of simple, discernible, inert, non-sacred cogs, but that machines, like Descartes' notion of a body or snail, a clover or a clock, were, like the universe, a self-propelled complex, a network of interconnected relations designed and handcrafted by God's genius, more seamless and integrated and brilliant a symphony than we can even imagine, all part of his divine miracle. And how else could it be to someone like Descartes? And I found that Descartes spells out as much. All of this seemed, once again, fiendishly contrarian. What then of those other ideas associated with Descartes, I wondered? He's referred to as a positivist or empiricist, or just said to have inspired these. But reading Descartes' works, I learned that, as a Roman Catholic, his God is an undeniable given, arrived at by faith, not logic. Not only that, but the power and truth of faith in the divine are found on nearly every page the man wrote. And this makes the titles of chapters and, and even entire books. And it's with this starting place, faith in God, that Descartes establishes his philosophical approach. He acknowledges that the senses are an insufficient basis for any serious inquiry. He observes the unsettling truth that we can never trust our senses, that we've all experienced our senses failing us, we've all been tricked by an optical illusion and know of phenomena like phantom limb syndrome. From there, with this fundamental distrust of the senses, is exactly how he arrives at his most famous aphorism, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But I discovered there that he didn't mean think in the modern sense, as in to have a thought or idea arise in consciousness, or to imagine something. No, that would be like the autonomous operations of your heart or lungs, or the kind of thing kittens or humpback whales get up to. Instead, he argues that the firmest foundation we can hope to have, beyond God, lies in the metacognitive, with introspection, with thinking about our thinking, doing so critically, judging our sensory inputs, doubting or affirming them. And, importantly, he says it's this, this miracle of what he calls the rational soul, our power of judgment gifted to us by his all-powerful creator, that makes us both different from oysters and centipedes, and, according to his faith, ultimately responsible to God in the afterlife. And all of this, let us not forget, was inspired by divine visions. In this way, theism, metaphysics, introspection, and intuition feel to me like the entire substance of Cartesian thought, which is to say, removing any one of these, never mind all of them, and I don't think you'd have anything that Descartes himself would recognize. So, I read Descartes as an ardent anti-empiricist, a potent anti-positivist. Making these and other arguments as I do throughout my thesis, arguing against a set of ideas about who Descartes was and what he was up to and where his ideas have landed us, ideas used to support so many journal articles and books by so many respected voices all fighting the good fight, sounds to some like I'm defending Descartes' views or cold mechanistic thinking or an overemphasis on rationality or any of what are said to be the results of these. In fact, 
Half the folks who read early drafts of this thesis of mine have come back to me suggesting that I may wish to rethink what is obviously transmuted into a regressive worldview, that have obviously switched sides, am in league with the other team, and am now taking shots on my own goal. I don't believe I'm doing any of that. That said, let there be no doubt, what I write in my thesis does sound absurd. I claim something like, I believe there's compelling philosophical, theological, historical, literary, and linguistic evidence to tell us something that must land on people like Hitler was not a Nazi, Mother Teresa not a Catholic nun, Sir Isaac Newton not a Newtonian. This thesis claims that, to me, based on my very limited research, Descartes, of all people, was not a Cartesian, that his big idea was not, I think, therefore I am, that he wasn't comparing the cosmos or animals to clocks, that he didn't establish a divisive dualism that shattered the universe separating humans from the non-human world, that he didn't seek to sap the sacred, and so much more. And all of this, I admit, sounds mad. Because of that, every step along the way I felt like I couldn't follow simple logic or understand the meaning of words, or was just terribly confused and out of my depth and had no business being in grad school. But at the same time, as more of these pieces came together, I couldn't help but feel there was something to this. But how was I going to share any of it? It seemed there was no simple way to explain any of this without forcing someone down a similarly arduous path to the one I'd gone on. And even if I could abbreviate this, nobody wants to hear about semantics, or the engineering that inspired medieval clockwork or how I interpret a translation of a 400-year-old Latin text. No. And it felt like I had no business talking about any of this. It was true. I don't have a background in philosophy or psychology, history or theology. And I've read effectively nothing from the history of science or medieval studies or anything pertinent. And I couldn't even read the source material. I don't speak French. Never mind old French. And I certainly don't read Latin. So how could I expect anyone to take me seriously? And then, typical critiques of Descartes' work and legacy condemn an overemphasis on positivist or empiricist approaches. So how could I even share these findings in a thesis, and to do so to the most relevant audience? Well, that's how this thesis wound up as an autophenomenological exploration. One following a hermeneutic cycle and focused on meaning, context, personal perception, and culture. What I discuss in my thesis, and the only thing I do know about and can hope to connect with others on, is my own experience. But it turned out not to be just me, not just my experience or my own terrible confusion and set of disagreeable contrarian takes. Eventually I found and had delivered to me, thank you Walter, works by real scholars who agree with me on some of these more prickly details. And then suddenly the implications, therefore, didn't feel so sophomoric as they had. In the end, I don't know if any of this Descartes stuff matters at all. And it's not really for me to say, but every bit of it makes me want to re-examine a mountain of scholarly and popular work, running across no less than 40 years, all of which use assertions about Descartes as a premise, because I feel there's some reason to believe these axioms, as seamless and sumptuous as they seem, may, just like Descartes' senses, provide no foundation at all. Ultimately, I feel like we're trying to have and be part of a global conversation across languages and cultures and fields of expertise. A conversation that's often framed as perhaps the most important conversation that has ever happened, and maybe ever will happen. I mean, we're talking about climate change and extinction. And increasingly, from where I sit, the deeper I get into all of this, my sense is that we commonly start from a premise that gets our own history and culture and language backwards. Maybe perfectly so. And from there, if only to me, the diagnosis can only feel off, and thus the suggested remedies, too. So, if I had to make a recommendation, or could have a wish granted, it would be that things be rendered less simple and appealing, and instead be allowed to be how they so often are, complexly contextualized and messy. Or maybe even ugly. <laughs>